Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. And welcome to this learning experience. My name is Cody, and I'd love to welcome you back to Tech Strong Learning, where we have another exciting panel ahead. Before we get this conversation rolling, I do have a couple of housekeeping notes I'd like to review with you. First of all, today's session is being recorded. So if you miss any of our discussion, perhaps you'd like to rewatch or maybe share with your team, you will be receiving an email with a link to access the on-demand recording uh, shortly after we conclude this live session today. If you'd like to engage with us, there are a couple of options for you to do so. The first option is the chat tab on the right side of your screen. So I see we've got a global audience already, but I do wanna see where everyone else is from. So let us know from where in the world you are joining. If you have any specific questions, we would like you to direct those to the Q&A tab. Sending in your questions to the Q&A helps us keep track of them a little bit better, and we want to include as many of your questions as we can throughout our conversation. Uh, if you jump over to the handout section, you'll see there are a few resources that Tenable has uploaded for you, so feel free to grab those. And of course, before we close things out today, we are giving away four $25 Amazon gift cards, so be sure to stick around to see if you're one of our lucky winners. Our conversation today is on Kubernetes security, and I'm joined by Payush Sharma, VP of Engineering at Tenable, and Mike Bazard, Chief Content Officer here at TechStrong Group. So Payush, thank you so much for joining us today. Mike, do you wanna get this conversation rolling? Happy to, and I happen to love this topic because I know it's top of mind for a lot of folks, but I think we wanna get started with some level setting. So Payush, let me ask you something. So many of the folks that I talk to about Kubernetes security have some expectation that the controls that they created somewhere else will just automatically run on Kubernetes. So what makes securing Kubernetes different than, say, everything else that we've seen so far? What are some of the things that people should be looking out for from the get-go? Uh, thank you. My great question, and uh, thank you for having me here, Cody. Uh, it's a great question, and I think, um, you know, it sets the foundation of everything that we do and talk about in Kubernetes world. <clears throat> Kubernetes is the most widely used application orchestration platform today. 92%, I think it's uh, Gartner's uh, numbers some time ago that 92% of enterprises are using Kubernetes in production, which means it becomes the biggest surface of technology tools that customers are using. But what makes it more complicated and what makes it more difficult to manage from a posture, security posture standpoint are there are multiple control planes. So if you look at your cloud platform, your cloud platforms has multiple control plane, your cloud providers control plane like AWS, Azure, GCPs, and then you have your own network control planes, which defines your network parameters. And then there are application control planes like Kubernetes, they all managed differently. They have a differential velocity of the changes being made. That makes it even more harder because the teams are getting distributed, teams are getting remote, and all these things being managed at a differential velocity. So what happens is your security teams constantly looking at how do I secure my Kubernetes infrastructure where my application crown jewels are running, but at the same time, developer teams sitting back in somewhere remote has been pushing new changes. And Kubernetes is known for um, uh, providing the value over velocity. And that velocity translates into blind spots that, that uh, it can introduce. And that is what it makes it very, very difficult and very complex also. All these blind spots translates into eventual exploits that breach, uh, attackers are trying to exploit and, and getting into your infrastructure. And the last, not the least, what makes it more difficult is the remediation. So even if you find something that you want to fix in, in the cloud or in your production environment, you have to go back to developer or DevOps who is managing it. So that, that finding and fixing is a very complex process. Right. To your point about attackers and vulnerabilities and things that they're looking to exploit, what is the current state of that activity? Because... I think we've reached the point now where we're starting to see some stuff in the real world. I think security was an afterthought for the development of Kubernetes initially, and we made some efforts to kind of fix and change that. But, you know, we're now having some real world experience. And of course, you know, nothing goes as planned. So what are you seeing out there? What are folks encountering? 
No, absolutely. And and let's let's agree to you know on one one point. The Kubernetes is meant to improve the developer velocity or improving your agility of the organization on how fast you can go. The security is an afterthought. There are best practices. There are good standards. But how do you ensure that those good standards are being enforced? The right checks are in place. It's a hard problem. And uh, to your earlier point, we have already started seeing a bunch of uh, uh, breaches and attacks that are happening on Kubernetes infrastructure. And I mean, there are crypto jacking happening, there are credential stealing happening, there are data exploits are happening. And also uh, uh, Kubernetes, because it's orchestrated application code, it's also becoming the, the, the breeding ground for a lot of malware that, that stays and eventually over a period of time, they become the path to your breaches. You know, I, I want to follow up on that crypto jacking comment because it seems to me, at least in my experience, a lot of people consider that to be a nuisance crime and they don't really look too hard into it. But it seems to me also that the credentials have been breached or somehow or other accessed and it's only a matter of time before somebody starts to deliver something that perhaps is a little more lethal. Absolutely. And uh, it's not a nuance anymore because um, there's a cost. There's a cost involved. Uh, these crypto jacking translates into hogging all your GPUs and CPUs that are running for your infrastructure, right? And that translates into the cost today, the real dollar value. And that's the, that's the part, right? So if they take someone else's money, use it for some other purpose, make money on both the sides. So they save the cost and GPUs. So crypto jacking is just one aspect of the entire breach process. If they're able to crypto jack your infrastructure, means they have been running certain file, you know, certain processes, containers, and pods in Kubernetes infrastructure for crypto mining, they can essentially do anything. Your application has access to all your data, S3 buckets, your databases, dynamos, and everything. So just don't look at that as a crypto jacking as a one nuance. It's actually give you the perspective that yes, you already have something which allow attackers to get into your environment and do whatever they want to do. So what is your current assessment of the overall state of Kubernetes security? Are we in a good spot but we haven't implemented all the controls yet or is there work to be done by the technical oversight committee in this area or the various yeah. um, subunits that take care of security? Where, where are we on the journey? Um, you know, interesting point, and I'll, I'll follow up on with the previous point that you just mentioned, Mike. Uh, if you look at some of the recent breaches, some of the recent breaches in February 2023, there was a Scarlet Teal attack happened in which the credential was stolen. Then in 2019, there was a Docker Hub attack happened. Um, the images got replaced. Your, uh, you know, Microsoft Azure faced something related with the crypt crypto uh, you know, crypto side where Kubeflow's UI dashboard was, uh, you know, uh, stolen. The credential was stolen. Tesla went through. So there are, there are, there is a pattern here. The pattern is that some of these were really complicated uh, attacks to detect, but some of them are really simple problems that you could have detected. And that's the state. And this is why I'm bringing the reason I'm bringing all these attacks up that misconfigurations are still at the top of all the root cause for all the breaches. Whether it is misconfiguration between your cloud provider and your Kubernetes. So let's say if you're using a managed service from managed Kubernetes services from AWS Azure or GCPs, you basically depends on their configuration to be completely aligned with your Kubernetes infrastructure at the same time. That And that, that, that means that you need controls that looks at things holistically, not just looking at the Kubernetes security in, a, in an isolation. It has to put contextualize with your AWS cloud providers or, or other cloud providers along with your databases. So that's that's the security challenge there. In, in, in Kubernetes security, the current state also has the huge -ish concerns around runtime phase. You, you did all the checks, you, you put all the balances, you did all the assessment, but the infrastructure is now up and running. But what is happening in the runtime still a huge concern means are there more changes happening? Some con pods are getting converted into uh, privileged containers and so on and so forth. So in fact, one of the recent study, um, one of the recent study um, done by Red Hat, they almost 
they identify that almost every organization in today's world have experienced security issues in their Kubernetes deployments, and which translates into productivity loss, dollar loss, and eventual reputation loss also. And that's the uh, Kubernetes security that 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 identify all these gaps between how you deploy controls for your cloud providers, for infrastructures, and other layers. Mm. Who's in charge of Kubernetes security these days? I mean, I think that's part of the issue that organizations are running into. It's it's not clear, right? There's DevOps teams, there's developers who may have provisioned things. Now there's IT ops and platform engineering folks running around, and of course the security folks. So between all those folks, whose kind of you know, responsibility is it to see to all this? It's a great point, actually. Uh, good question. See, fundamentally, uh, fundamentally, security starts with security teams. Nobody else has the responsibility above security teams on if infrastructure is governed and secured properly. However, however, the security organization defines the policies based on which uh, this whole security system and controls are needs to be in place. Whereas DevOps, because they are custodian of the infrastructure, are responsible to ensuring that their standards and best practices are being followed. And that's that is that is the difference. There is team, a security team who defines how the infrastructure needs to be protected and what needs to be protected. And the actual implementation of controls and tools happens by the DevOps or Sec DevOps. I feel that works in theory, but sometimes I feel like I'm watching a baseball game where the ball keeps dropping between the shortstop and center field and everybody calls, I got it, and then nobody got it. So right. you know, how do I kind of like bridge that in a way to make it work? I think um, I, you're absolutely right. It happens, and we see this more often because now there are two 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 separate organizations who are working with each other. It's a complex situation. In my opinion, we need to work with a single focus that secure, what are the objectives that we want to achieve out of this whole security program. The program objective translates into what are the different integration points in your Kubernetes lifecycle. Kubernetes is not infrastructure that just works off I can log into AWS, create some clusters, and create some pods, and I'm done. It's completely automated system as of today. The uh, entire Kubernetes infrastructure and pretty much all organization today is governed by infrastructure as code, which is written and implemented by DevOps teams. They take permissions from security teams to deploy on a production cluster, and that's where the SecOps team comes into picture. I think those integration points needs to be aligned and understood by these teams and what policies to be applied. And this is why, this is I'm, I'm, I'm double quoting it, that this is why policy as code has become so common denominator across all these systems. You cannot have different type of policies that are assessing your security in design time, in the build time, or in the run time. You need to have a unified policy infrastructure that allows you to assess your security vulnerabilities in a consistent fashion. So that when security team creates those policies or identifies those policies, developers do not have to really recreate those just because it is running in the design time. So policy as code helps significantly bridging these gaps. Policy code is nothing but a definition which developers would understand. Security has been defining it. And this is the bridge that will help both the teams to come on the same level. Mm -hmm. Do you think as part of that operational workflow that we need to make sure that the versions of Kubernetes are somewhat up to date because each new version fixes a certain amount of security issues? But when I go talk to some folks, they have versions of Kubernetes running as far back as 112, and we're on, I think, 127. And they have everything in between. And so nobody kind of, the assumption from the Kubernetes team was that you would only be three releases behind and you would constantly be updating. The reality is nobody wants to break an API, so they leave it as it is. And then we have security issues. So do we kind of understand the need to upgrade consistently or can we? Right. I think um, one, uh, you know, sitting on the older version of Kubernetes is not going to help because it's a very fast evolving infrastructure tool. So if you are running an older version, even if you don't think about, think about security, you still upgrade. 
purely for the newer capabilities that security so kubernetes has been releasing number one number two this should be part of your governance and security policy that and like any other windows or mac operating system that you patch every time it is nothing but you got to patch your kubernetes infrastructure with the latest version of your operating systems so uh, your gold imaging of your um, you know containers your your baseline kubernetes cluster patching or upgrading have to be a constant uh, and never it cannot be on the back burner yeah. we have a question from one member of our audience that I kind of want to dive into a little bit because the nature of the security issue is changing in this regard. <clears throat> We're seeing more data right. starting to run on the Kubernetes clusters itself. A lot of people are starting to run stateful applications. And for those of you that have watched previous episodes, you know that there's this ongoing debate between stateful and stateless. But the question I would ask you is, if we're seeing more data on the cluster itself, do we need to figure out ways to secure that data that are uh, maybe more challenging or different? Right. Uh, I think there are two kind of. You are absolutely right. The two type, the two way you have been running the Kubernetes infrastructure today. So in idle world, your application infrastructure like Kubernetes have to be stateless, so that your data is stored in the respective repositories and not as part of your running containers. It has an implication just not on security. It has an implication of uh, stateless, stateful, being stateful has an implication on your performance, your resiliency, your backup, and et cetera. However, uh, the measure that you need to take place that integrity and confidentiality has been ma uh, maintained is about identity. So you've got to ensure that what different RBACs and permissions your pods and containers and your files and processes have. Kubernetes provide those controls. Means you can take some, I can give you some examples like, hey, I do not, cannot have any, any container to become privileged container in runtime directly. So you've got to have certain controls that prevent those kind of things where credential stealing can be avoided. See, at the end, data is going to be in either in some mounted volume or in the data stores. The only way to access this data is by getting some authorized credentials. And those credentials are available with the application code or the configuration file. And this is why RBAC permissions of clusters and, and the permissions of your containers and pods are extremely important. And all of this, the good part is, all of this can be governed as part of Kubernetes infrastructure. You do not have to do anything special about that, which means that if you use if you apply certain controls, even before infrastructure is created, for example, you have your policy guardrails in your pipeline, or you have a you have a configuration analysis of your cluster, you will be able to prevent most of these problems well in time. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> some great measures available um, for for some of these kind of situations. But great question. <clears throat> you can also not talk about identity without getting into this whole zero trust conversation that people right. are having these days and. Right. Um, there's a lot of people who say that you know work needs to be done on the role-based access controls for Kubernetes as it currently stands or could improve at the very least. So what is your sense of what is feasible from a zero trust perspective in Kubernetes? Can I get there or is that kind of like, you know, it's a North Star, but I'm never going to get there 100 percent. What should people expect? So 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 there are two part of me, uh, Mike. I'll answer you from the from the theorist and the purist part. Mm -hmm. I completely agree that um, the zero trust must be maintained, given there are so many different layers working with each other in the runtime. You do not know what changes when, right? So that whole change in so dynamic. However, is it possible? Yes, it is possible. But if you go back a couple of questions back, you ask me the security. What is the current state of Kubernetes security? misconfigurations are still at the top of the issues. So even before we get into the getting the zero trust, we got to first get the control on these very basic and foundational issues. Mm -hmm. And it will help us, all of us, eliminate those 70, 80%, 80, 20% rule, in my opinion, that if you do this 20% part, your 80% of the problem can go away, and then we can start focusing on zero trust. So there are different ways you can maintain and establish zero trust. 
but that's harder if you continues to have those misconfiguration sort of problems. Where do all those misconfigurations come from? Is it just because developers are spinning stuff up and they don't really know what they're doing? Or is it just that the platform is so complex that anybody's going to make a mistake? So the platform is quite flexible. It's completely API driven. In my opinion, these problems are not sometimes it's del uh, you know sometimes these are unintended what happens is your kubernetes is completely defined in the code it's completely declarative uh, programming language that we use we use kubernetes yamls hem charts or infrastructure as code like that are formed to create and govern the infrastructure now when you defining your resources your containers and pods and cluster in those code that's where we make the mistakes which is uh, I would take the standard implementation and create my cluster. But standard implementation is done at a platform level, it means platform does not know what your specific needs are. And that is where you need to start tuning your code, infrastructure as code, so that your running clusters are more secure. So you need controls. There are controls like infrastructure as code technology like Tenable has, or there are pipeline technologies that Tenable has, those are the technologies are meant for that, so that you can detect those kind of, uh, you know, misconfiguration well in time. All right. We have a follow-up question on the whole stateful issue, so let's just jump to that for a second while it's relatively top of mind. But the question is, what are the security implications of stateful persistent volumes that are attached to Kubernetes pods and service application database instances because you know the ankle bone is connected to the thigh bone and it all comes together right <laughs> yeah you know fantastic question so you know this will this will um, you know bring the whole breach path for one of the breach path that mm -hmm. can happen on kubernetes is because of this so it's a perfect question to talk about that so stateful pers persistent volume uh, are going to hold your application data or the data that your application depends on. And this data can be any form. It could be binaries, it could be files and processes, or it could be an application transactional data. Now, all that data or the persistent volume will have certain vulnerabilities, or it will allow the transient data to be accessible by attacker even without going to your database. So think about this. You have your application, think you have cloud provider layer, then you have Kubernetes cluster layer, then there is a container layer and the last is a database layer. So if you continues to have your transient data, which could be a confidential data that is just waiting to get into your database, could also be breached even without you actually go to the database. So any malware that is able to get to your application code or through your application binaries can actually have access to all the data that you have in your persistent volume. So it's a pretty big, it's a pretty big um, security gap. What is your sense of the impact that all this focus on software supply chains might be having on this conversation? Because I feel a lot of times we're starting from the process where people are going, the supply chain is insecure. And then they're like, well, what kind of applications that we have? And then they go, what is this thing called Kubernetes that this stuff is running on? So, you know, yeah. are we starting to see a lot more focus on this as a result? Yeah, so I think I think supply chain have been there for long very long time. Um, I mean, I grew up from an endpoint world where certain um, you know application code was vulnerable, got deployed by through an agent, and then agent got breached, and eventually AD got controlled, right? So that was another type of supply chain. In my opinion, in the cloud, everything is assembled in your design mode. Means your application code, your infrastructure as code, your Kubernetes code, your cloud code, everything is declarative today. Your developers are, or DevOps are not sitting and creating each and every infrastructure by hand. So essentially, it's like any other car that is being assembled in the factory and being delivered to you for actual running. And that is exactly what supply chain is about. Because everything is assembled means when you build your application code, you bring in some third-party data, third-party applications, or your own application vulnerabilities. You pull them together, get deployed to Kubernetes, or, or any other infrastructure in the runtime, and then attacker knows where to go because they have the they have imperson impersonated certain good binaries with their own malware binaries, or there are some dormant uh, files that exist which does not have the vulnerabilities. 
So that is why the entire security shift to the left is so meaningful. And so you have to secure by design now. You cannot just wait your infrastructure to be up and running. Well, talking about security by design, um, a lot of these instances of Kubernetes are running in the cloud and we have this shared responsibility model. But I feel like sometimes people are assuming the cloud provider is doing more than they do. So where does this shared responsibility model fit in the age of Kubernetes, which is a type of infrastructure? But, you know, as one president once said, perhaps we need to uh, trust but verify what exactly should we be doing here? Yeah, and, and actually, this has been a long going debate. Uh, but in my opinion, they are the platforms. The platform will provide things that works in general form for all their customers. So they will provide knobs on to have a better security on infrastructure that is running on AWS or Azure or GCP. But you will have to do that knobbing. That knobbing or that creation or defining those knobs have to be done by the security teams or the DevOps teams. Number one. Number two. Um, number two is uh, the shared responsibility model is not enforceable till the time you start putting controls in place. And this is why you need to start thinking that security, especially in Kubernetes world, have to be preventative, not reactive. You remember, right? We are assembling everything through our application code or infrastructure as code. That is why we have to be more preventative and cannot be wait for my infrastructure to be up and running and start detecting the problem. Number two, in this, in this world, in, in Kubernetes world where the changes are so dynamic and so fast, we have to work over guard, 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 on work on guardrails over blocking. You cannot wait for your processes, your misconfigurations or RBAC problems to be blocked in the runtime because it will break your application posture. That is why the guardrails are required. And last is security, secure by design. Secure by design means that, like I mentioned, that I need to insist certain configurations that are or the practices are followed even before infrastructure is created. How do I implement those guardrails? You mentioned that Kubernetes is a declarative platform. You talked a little bit about policy as code, but how do I put that into a DevOps workflow that becomes, you know, a DevSecOps workflow optimized for cloud native Kubernetes environments? Yeah. You know, those guardrails, there are two kind of guardrails. One that happens when you're actually writing that infrastructure as code. So anytime you make the changes in the code, the controls, like the tools like Tenable Cloud Security can actually detect the problem right when you're writing that code. The second guardrail, the second stage of the guardrail is the pipeline. So you might be running your CI, CD, your GitOps world, which is like you know, have Rancher or those kind of platforms where you are building your application clusters or a Kubernetes clusters and deploying them. So just before deployment, you can add another step. It's a very simple thing to do where uh, tools like Tenable Cloud Security can come in and assess all that your policies that you want to assess. The interesting part is you can do this by a single policy now. Means you do not have to really create three policies, one for the code, one for the build, and one for the runtime. And that's the that's why the policy in code goes so to common denominator. Whether you're in the design, whether you're in the runtime, you've got to have these kind of controls in place. Yeah. We have a question from one of our attendees who wants to know about, do you have any suggestions for scanning Kubernetes containers for vulnerabilities? And while yeah. you're on that topic, how often? Because you know I hear folks complain about it, but then you know, when I ask them about it, they haven't scanned for two weeks and then they wonder why it takes forever. Yeah, and uh, 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 it's a very good question. So again, uh, scanning the containers for vulnerabilities can happen in the design time as well as in the runtime. I always go with starting with the design, which is assessing the images that are being used to create your pods and containers. I think that's the first step. That step is something unavoidable. And if you are not using doing it today, you must do it. What it will do is it will first help you understand that what are the pre-built vulnerabilities in your running infrastructure. It means these are the vulnerabilities already running on infrastructure, number one. Number two, it will help you gold 
baseline middle grade like a gold image back in days and hey this is this this is my gold status of my infrastructure anything that changes over this could be an anomaly so helping set establishing that baseline is the first step starting your vulnerability detection for containers and then you can go in the runtime deploy the agent or do agent less and and detect all the vulnerabilities in your running containers so that's the that's in my opinion should be the first step the first step is the most important i reiterate connect your images or your repository and registry where those images are stored have them scanned and baseline them before your infrastructure is created how much do cybersecurity people need to know about kubernetes a lot of them are scratching their heads going this thing's complex how much of an expert do i have to be there's an argument that says uh, containers can be used to hijack infrastructure. So how deep do they need to go and what do they need to think about? I think I think they need to know. Unfortunately, <laughs> there is no avoidance to it. They do not need to know the operating system or the kernels or the controllers, etc. But at the at the logistic level, that what what happens when an infrastructure has been created and how it works, I think at that level should be good enough because then only they will be able to identify what different ways my kubernetes infrastructure can be breached so there is uh, unfortunately this is the new world and uh, um, i will not talk about more challenges here but uh, if you do not understand uh, how kubernetes really works not at the implementation level at the how to level i think that without that it's very hard to figure out that what breaches can happen in my infrastructure every infrastructure is different all right. There's a phrase out there now called Kubernetes security posture management. One of our attendees wants to know what that means exactly. How do I kind of approach that? And, you know, without giving too hard of a product pitch, but, you know, how do you guys actually play in that space? So, so Tenable Cloud Security has been a big advocate of Kubernetes security posture management. When I say sub posture management, I'm talking about posture management is a start with the baseline. So whether it is design, whether it's runtime, baseline and infrastructure, and anything changes on that baseline is what needs to be focused on. There will be always hundreds and thousands of misconfiguration and vulnerabilities, and it is not possible to look at everything. And this is why the baseline is so important. So the KSPM involves detecting your vulnerabilities and misconfiguration, application vulnerabilities and misconfiguration and design, and then re reinforce or reassess the same thing in the runtime and find the anomalies. Okay, so I have these 10 different type of images running in my runtime, and these 10 exist in my images, but I found one which did not know where it came from. It was not in my registry. That's the anomaly. So when you start, think, start thinking like finding those anomalies, the problems becomes easier to find. Otherwise, it will be, again, find and fix problem always. And that's the KSPM. We bring all these things together, whether it is code, we do their infrastructure code scanning of Kube YAMLs and those. We provide you the policy guardrails uh, to detect these problems before the infrastructure is created. And we assess in the runtime by looking at your container or instances that are actually running. That's KSPM mm -hmm. in short. One of our attendees wants to know if we're going to maybe see more collaboration between the government and vendors for finding vulnerabilities. They're talking about an alert that was put together by the DOD. And yeah, are we going to get more help from other sources out there? And can we be more collaborative in our approach to Kubernetes security? What do you think? Right. I think DESA uh, has been quite aggressive. So DSA, I mean, I think just before this webinar, we were talking about that how Kubernetes have been uh, becoming a prevalent infrastructure in DODs also today. And mm -hmm. uh, not just the infrastructure cloud, it's also the aircrafts and those kind of things. So especially uh, software, Air Force software department have, have been working vehemently on putting these practices in place. I do not know if there is a vendor and DOD effort at that level, but Yes, we, we are aligned with how and whenever DSA or CSA or NSA releases any guidelines so that the vendors are compliant to what DOD is looking for. So, for example, Tenable Cloud Security has benchmark supported for DSA, NSA, CSA, and even meant specially customized for DOD efforts also. 
and then it's going to be certain policies and 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 the standards that must be enforced uh and that's something the tools are doing today where are we going to get the skills for all of this and where can you point people to get the skills because we already have a shortage of cybersecurity people notwithstanding and we also probably don't have enough kubernetes people and the number of people that know kubernetes and security is probably a very narrow window so how are we going to increase the number of folks that can help us with this um i think there are there are ton of programs that have been running by different organization including uh, uh kubernetes our, our our cloud native security foundation so if you follow cncf you would notice that they have ton of training programs on kubernetes these are free of cost some of them paid but if you don't want a certification they can be free of cost so there are different tracks of level of implementation you can start at the practitioner level which is meant for cybersecurity professional or you can go to the administrative level so i would recommend cloud native foundation who are heart and core for this kind of uh, training programs you can look at there or otherwise there was a lot of private organization as well as ton of youtube videos that you can start with it it is it is not complicated it is not difficult it just the perception that somehow kubernetes is very difficult it is not okay what role do you think ai might play in all of this cuz you can't walk down the street these days without somebody leaping out to tell you about their great new ai thing can we use ai to save ourselves from ourselves wow i i thought that i will end this conversation without ai but it will alas it will not something that's possible <laughs> you know I'll, i'll 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 not be long in answering this but just think about this generative ai is going to accelerate the challenges that we have been talking on this call i kept on saying since beginning that entire kubernetes infrastructure is declaratively defined and that is where gen ai comes into picture so gener- generative ai will allow developers to write code faster auto generated code which will translate into actual infrastructure and that's where that will accelerate the problems also so in my opinion and especially in the kubernetes kind of infrastructure ai will become a huge menace yes it will boost the productivity and writing the new code infrastructure but it will translate into misconfiguration and other problems there you go and a lot of those ai workloads are winding up on kubernetes clusters right exactly exactly all right We have another question that's kind of going back to our conversation about DISA, but one of our attendees wants to know what your thoughts are about the White House push for liability enforcement and cybersecurity regulation mandates across the software industry, incentivizing secure by design principles that you discussed and the safe harbor regime, but how will that all impact Kubernetes and cloud native security as our inquiring mind wants to know? So I think there's a pattern of the questions here. I just want to call that pattern out. <laughs> Somebody asked the question that hey how what will be the stateful implication of stateful persistent volume number 1. Number 2 we talked about scanning the vulnerabilities. Number 3 somebody talked about the stigs uh, initiatives on uh, by DISA uh, you know there's a memorandum by DISA and now you're asking the safe harbor statements. You know the what is what is in common in them the common is these are all benchmarks now right these are standards baselining and that translates into the policies that you need to assess before you go live right i'm coming back to the same point like a broken record that the policy as code is that tool to ensure that you are compliant and you remain compliant to all these memorandums to regular regulations and needs and benchmarks so i will lead to that there will be ton of other uh, benchmarks now will be coming up for there's just one on the privacy very recently now there will be ton of there will be coming on ai and so on and so forth but what remains constant and that remain the best friend of security is the policy as code mm-hmm. and that will allow you to assess the fine problems within these or the non compliance from these benchmarks right yeah. How smart will automation and AI get eventually? I mean, do you think we'll reach some point where I'll show up for work in the morning and uh the systems will tell me in in a way that's reliable that 
you know, here are the three things that are likely to get me fired today. And, you know, I should go fix these things. I mean, will the system kind of get smart enough to tell me where the misconfigurations are or where the data vulnerabilities are? Um, system can be very, very smart. I think um, given everything is so generative, declarative, right? So see, that, that's the difference between an application code and infrastructure as code where the business logic is all about configuration, which are statically defined, right? The declarative definitions is where this whole thing will explode in the sense it will accelerate. Yes, uh, it is possible that AI will start telling you in the morning that these are the 10 problems I found last night, and these are the 10 things that you need to look at. So, so generating uh, you know, new code, generating new infrastructure will get automated, no questions asked, right? Because all that is, uh, is a very static problem, it means those problems have been there. Those problems were solved by writing some standard line of code, which AI will automate, right? But what AI will not automate is, is this understanding of how, what are the different contexts of my infrastructure? And that's something human will continue to own. They will code it. They will write. They will have to continue modifying the policy as code. So policies is continuously driven by humans. And those are the deciphered versions of these regulation that White House releases or DISA have and those so on and so forth. Yes. So. All right. We have a question slash comment from the audience about um, do we pay enough for these folks with Kubernetes? And they point out that uh, if I understand this correctly, that um, network security pays more than double three times or and the average pay per year is around 65K for K8s and DevOps. So, you know, are we having some sort of gap between if I have any security expertise, maybe I'm going to go do something else because there's just not enough money in Kubernetes yet. So um, what's your sense of, you know, are we paying a, a reasonable rate for this level of security? Uh, that is a difficult question, honestly, Mike, for me to answer. And mm -hmm. uh, But I, I personally think that Kubernetes is, is a lowest common denominator these days to run your application infrastructure. So whether you work in DevOps, DevSecOps, or pure uh, compliance professional, you'd still have to know that. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, I, I think maybe we might not see Kubernetes security specialists as much as we might see yeah. the networking or the infrastructure That's folks correct. are expected to add that to their skill set. Yes, All that right. I kind of agree. All right, and hopefully they get paid more for adding that level of expertise, right? Yeah, and because because they, they may come from a different background altogether. See, mm -hmm. DevOps and us, Kubernetes security cannot be the same thing. DevOps will always think, what is the goals or the objectives of, of a DevOps person? Its objectives are performance, flexibility, mutability, immutability. But for security, these are right opposite. Another one of our participants, and it's a general question, but they want to know if you think organizations are really getting serious about security or are they still kind of just tipping their hat to it and trying to check a box? I mean, has the has the culture around security really fundamentally changed or are we just kind of talking about it more? Oh, I think it has changed. I can tell you in the last four to five years, I've seen a significant change in organizations. They are getting very serious about security. One of the recent uh, uh, report about state of community security did mention that almost all organization had security controls around Kubernetes. Now, What's the depth of those controls? I do not know, but the controls were in place and they were serious about the security. So if you have, if you feel that your organization is not, not serious enough about this problem, I think uh, uh, it's a conversation worth having. Mm -hmm. Because there are a ton of data points prove that everybody is going towards that. Or there's another organization out there that you might have worked for that is serious about it. So maybe one of the parameters that you should be using to determine where you want to spend your time is how serious is the organization you work for, right? Absolutely. Right. We talked about misconfigurations, but you know, you've, you've seen a lot of instances. What's that kind of a couple of things that you see folks doing when it comes to securing Kubernetes environments that still shakes your head a little bit and you go, 
God, I think we're better than this. And, you know, what's your best advice for kind of working through and elevating the level of maturity around security? Yeah. See, um, again, I think what is the most, my, my advice on this particular question would be is think it like a funnel. The funnel starts, the, the funnel is, which is horizontal, means you must find 80, 90% of your problems before your infrastructure is running, means it is deployed. And then, so that when you look at your runtime, which you can hardly fix in runtime, are minimal. So those problems, if you if you are 80% of the problems can be found in your application infrastructure as code or in your pipeline, then why not? It's no brainer, right? So what happens is, and that's where I feel bad when I see some of these breaches. Damn, these problems I would have, I could have found in my infrastructure code or my pipeline would have detected this. So those controls, those guard rays are the most things that we cannot avoid and we must start there. All right. So to that point, and this follows up one of our questions from the audience, this is, so what makes zero trust security so difficult for organizations to achieve? Is it lack of urgency, cost, expertise? I mean, we've been talking about zero trust for many years in some regards, but where are we on this journey? Yeah, actually, I, this could be my opinion, and um, mm -hmm. I want to put that disclaimer there. In my opinion, zero trust security can be actually very intrusive in nature. So, for example, zero trust security cannot complete unless you have an enforcement controls placed in your infrastructure, which means that you define security or zero trust. The trust was established, but you figured out in the runtime that trust was not good. So you need a control to be able to block it. And that's the intrusion I'm talking about, that, that intrusivity of that control, which means that you need an agent sitting in your container or pod or your cluster or your node, actually kinds of makes it more difficult. So in my opinion, that's the challenge in zero trust, especially in this kind of a world where the, in cloud, there's no place for agents. Let's be honest, because agent does add friction. Yes, mm -hmm. there is need, there is everything, but it comes with the huge cost of friction, changing the builds and pipelines, and also getting more involved with your develop, development team. I think that's the fundamental issue. So unless cloud providers be able to come to the level where they allow vendors to, to take more control over runtime, this problem is very hard to solve. Right. Again, this is my personal comment and could be very wrong. I scratched my head about agents because basically it requires the very people who are creating the misconfigurations to deploy and maintain the agents in the first place. So maybe, you know, if they were doing it right the first time, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Um, we have a great question here. It's short, but uh, would threat modeling be useful in this scenario or is the attack surface too dynamic? Fantastic question. Fantastic question. And, um, I think this threat, this is an old practice and I'm, I'm old school. So I always talk about, hey, you start with threat modeling and your threat model should be part of your pipelines. Anytime you push the new code out to production or running infrastructure, you must update your threat models. So threat model is a great way to start. And especially if you taking your on-prem application or private data center application to the cloud, because that's the time you must understand that what could different ways your organization where your cluster can be breached. So I have some fantastic suggestions and the point that he just made. Mm -hmm. To what degree do you think organizations should be doing this themselves or should I just go find a, somebody who's a managed security service provider and they're an expert in the space and rely more on them or do they just kind of provide basic monitoring? I mean, what is the level of, uh, investment that I should be making as an organization versus consuming as a service? So um, the difficult question, honestly, to answer, Mike, but there are two parts of this entire process. The first is the identifying the threats 
or the path attack paths and second is documenting them and updating them i think the second part is more time consuming tedious and require more effort but the first part can be done by somebody who understands how the infrastructure has been created so there has to be a combination this has to be a combined effort between your engineering and security team so yes outsourcing can be done but i do only for the documentation part in my opinion sure what should i do long term here ultimately am i taking somebody from cybersecurity and trying to put them into a devops kind of scenario and hope they learn devops or am i trying to create somebody who is say the security advocate on the devops team and i'm trying to teach them security in the first place but you know not every developer i know really wants to do security so how do i kind of strike a balance between these extremes yes and <laughs> and uh, you know brilliant question uh, but my answer remains the same like a broken record that for a security professional to get into code and understanding pipelines is not possible it may be possible technically is is possible it's just that you will not never have the sufficient time to do it so how you lead is lead by defining the standards security teams needs to define the standards and policy on which they want to assess the infrastructure and focus on non compliance because that's the starting point i think that's how you going to scale that hey these are the 100 policies or 100 use cases that i want to assess my kubernetes infrastructure if any of these use cases are failing one you must run it in your pipelines second if it fails i want to be notified i think that's the starting point so you define you sit down do the threat modeling do the assessment on how policies are important what region you are in what white white house memorandums etc you need to follow based on that come up with the desired set of policies and apply them in all stages of your infrastructure and that's the that is the only way you can scale all right speaking of scale we're back to ai but um the question is can ai be used to implement security policies and monitoring of threats instead of the humans since humans are fallible and theoretically machines never take a day off and uh, perhaps don't make a mistake but of course we know they hallucinate so what is the right balance here i think the balance is going to be is ai will do what you task them to do right so even if it is self learning it needs a starting point starting point is if you start with ai and ask that hey ai can you go and tell you know secure my infrastructure or or right implement my security policy the first question ai is going to ask hey what benchmarks and standards you want me to follow and that determination of that answer requires human means that require understanding your infrastructure understanding the threat landscape understanding your threat model so humans again going back to the same thing human or security pol- security professionals should focus on defining the standards defining the governance standards and policies and then you hand it over to devops or ai or whomsoever it is i consider ai is a another robot engineer who does when i tell them what to do so yes you can create or implement the security policies but the 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 intelligent part of this entire process is defining that part and that cannot be done without humans mm-hmm. So if I look at all the questions and go into your method before there is a common theme starting to emerge which is kind of as follows do I need to like have a kubernetes specialist who's really focused on security of that platform or as kubernetes becomes mainstream is it just becoming another platform that we're securing alongside everything else and we need a motion to do that that's cost effective but ultimately Kubernetes is just one of many. Um I think having I I and again this is going to be my opinion could vary from organization to organization but in my opinion having a understanding or a knowledge skill within the kubernetes knowledge skill within the security team is going to be very 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 helpful. Because how you configure there are different components of kubernetes can also be in play right from egress controller ingress controllers how they interact with the lbs and elbs etc those are nitty gritties 
that uh, security team would eventually will come to know and will have to learn so having somebody in house is always going to be beneficial all right coming back on the other side of this a little bit um like it or not sometimes compliance and regulators drive security investment certainly insurance companies are playing a larger role in this conversation do you think those folks have learned how to spell kubernetes yet do they know what they're looking at and you know are they going to come around the other side of this thing looking for all this stuff yeah so yes the the question is absolutely right so spot on uh, you know observation however the organization like disa a csa they, that's where they come into picture. The CIS, for example, CIS have been constantly taking, working with vendors like us. They're taking our suggestions and and looking at the threat landscape and come up with these new versions of their benchmarks. I, I've never seen CIS evolving so fast in the last few years for the amount of evolution they've done for cloud. So every month, every alternate month, you will see new, new you know, bench, benchmark or the new version gets being updated. So it's a constant thing now. These, we should rely on these organizations to do more and identify, let them identify more. All right. This is going to be our last question. I want you to think about this for a minute. You have been made king of all things Kubernetes security. You could fix it with a wave of your wand. What is that one thing you wish that the technical oversight committee or some of the folks that manage the stack in general would focus on to make everybody's life easier? Ah, good question. I think it, it's a, it's an idealist question, so I'll I'll answer as purist. So I would love to invest in a tool that does not break my visibility into my Kubernetes infrastructure into pieces. Number one. So I want that comprehensive comprehensive visibility into everything around Kubernetes. It's pods, it's clusters, and cluster and everything. Number two, I want a single tool that does all these detections, whether it is code, design, runtime, and do the correlation among three. Because these are not three different pieces. And last is also just the compliance. So compliance could also be very fragmented, means a governance vendor of community management company can tell you that hey, these are the great policies that you need to apply. My job is to secure. My job is not to improve the performance. I really want this tool to help me the trade-off between performance and security. Cool. Folks, I want to thank Payesh for sharing his knowledge and insights. I'm going to hand it back to Cody, who's going to take us out. But this is an evolving space, so you now know as much as anybody else. Thanks for being thank here with me. us. Cody, awesome. take us home. Payush and Mike, thank you both so much for joining us today. Um, so I would like to remind everyone that today's session was recorded. You will be receiving an email with a link to access this recording on demand, or of course you can find it living on the Cloud Native Now website. Just visit cloudnativenow.com slash webinars, and you'll find it in the on-demand section. The four winners of our $25 Amazon gift card drawing are Bernard F., Chongwei W., Jamai E., and Nagor S. So congratulations to our four winners. Keep your eyes on your inbox. Uh, your gift card should make its way to you in the next 48 hours. If you don't happen to see that email, check your spam folder just in case it happens to get filtered out. Um, and I do just want to point everyone to the link that I put in the chat um, for our survey. And if you don't want to click on that chat, feel free to just stick around and you'll be funneled directly to that survey in a moment. But we would love to hear your feedback, whether it's about today's program or suggestions for future topics. Please let us know. Either way, we do hope to see everyone at a future TechStrong learning experience. Have a great rest of your day, and you may now disconnect. Mike, Payush, thank you again. Thank you. Bye.